It's so good to be with you. Um, as my wife and I were preparing to come here, I said, well, honey, uh, it's probably going to be overcast. Uh, we're going to get dumped on. It's going to get chilly. And from the moment we arrived, it's been nothing but sunshine. And I was like, okay, well, thank you, Lord, for that. And, uh, but not just that, brothers and sisters, since we have arrived on your shores, uh, the brothers and sisters that we have met, it's been very, very precious. And we've been welcomed. And we have been shown incredible hospitality. And we're very, very grateful uh, to be here with you today. And it is a truth that God has friends in every city. In every city. And we're finding that the more we go along, that is a truth. And we're grateful for that, brothers and sisters. Uh, God willing, we're going to go on a little journey here today. And I hope you want to come along with me. Uh, there is a purpose for our coming here. Ireland has been a jewel in many ways. Obviously, your heritage says the jewel of the Lord. You have a rich and incredible Christian heritage here. And as an American, I have looked from afar. Your nation has always, always given me hope. Always. But we also know we deal with an enemy who has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy and the same shenanigans he has pulled in America is now setting up shop in your nation. And through God's providence, somehow the brothers and sisters here got in contact with me. And I was pretty amazed uh, because I know rejection really well. I, I got rejection down. Uh, you know, that's... <laughs> Acceptance makes me a little nervous. <laughs> Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> you know, uh, but they, they found out about us, and we did this Zoom meeting, and I just thought there would be like three or four people, but there was a lot of people on the Zoom meeting, and they introduced me, and, and I just, you know, said a, you know, a few opening words, and I said, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, I'm your servant. What do you need? How can I help? And so they started, you know, asking a lot of pertinent, important questions. And by the grace of God, I was able to give biblical answers. And I will tell you, in that Zoom meeting, the sweet presence of God was there. It, it, it wasn't weird. Like, I, you know, I, I'm a stranger. I've never met these people before. We're across the seas. And it was just like we were instantly knit by the Spirit of God. And then I heard the prayers of your pastors. And it was, it was like from their gut. It was from their bowels. They're crying out to God. And that's so rare today. You know, we do our obligatory prayers. You know what I'm saying? But their cry was, God, send a heaven-sent revival. You know, break this these abominations, these idolatries that are being set up in this land. Deliver us from this evil, oh God. And, and as they're crying out, I'm going, oh my, these are my peeps. The, the, these are, yes, I was like, yeah, we're, we're knit. And, uh, and so that's pretty much how I got invited here and what we have gone through to get here. Oh my gosh, I won't go into all that story, but we're here. Praise God. And so I want to take you on a little journey with God's dealings in my life and just maybe minister some truths from the scripture so you can understand what is being set up in your nation and what that portends for your future. Okay? Obviously, this is a very serious time for your nation. You're at the crossroads here, okay? And we got to take it serious, brothers and sisters, because we're dealing with an enemy. He's not playing games. When it says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, you better mark it down. That's exactly what he's about. 
But the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, what? The spirit of the Lord is going to raise up a standard against him. A standard. Everybody say standard. And we're going to be talking about that standard. That standard is this book. That standard is God's word. And it applies to the church and it also applies to the state. Jesus is Lord of the church, but he's also king of the state. One of his titles, it's not ecclesiastical, it's political. King of kings, Lord of lords. The book of Revelation says he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. A lot of Christians have lost sight of this. And we're being duped by tyranny. Being duped. We're going along to get along. At what price to our children and our grandchildren? And so really one of the strong things that we need to understand, God's word is the authority and it speaks to all manner of life. God is not silent about law. He's not silent about government. Do you know the God of heaven is actually concerned about how we govern our lives? Could you imagine? He is. And a lot of Christians have, we do not have a biblical worldview, especially when it comes to civil government. We're pretty good on the individual. We're pretty good on the family. We're pretty good on the church. But I'm going to tell you, there's a blind spot when it comes to civil government. And this enemy is taking advantage of that ignorance. And he's got a plot and a scheme. And the Bible says you better not be ignorant of it. You better give him no place. Do you understand right now through your government he has found an opening? He has found a place. And, and it's getting so strong they just criminalized Christianity. They just did it. Understand with child sacrifice and the shedding of blood... It automatically leads to tyranny. See, when you're dealing with evil of this magnitude, see, evil says, tolerate us, tolerate us, tolerate us. And so we tolerate it. But as it climbs the ladder and gains the ascendancy, then it's a matter of supremacy. It, it moves from tolerance to supremacy. And then once evil captures that sword of civil government, it will not tolerate dissent. Think about the strong man. Remember the parables of Jesus? Who's the strong man in that parable? It's, it's the enemy. It's the devil, right? His arms are folded because his goods are at peace. That's just what happened to you. The strong man came into your land, found an opening, and now he is folding his arms because he's guaranteed now that, that darkness has come. That what do we have to do to protect that darkness? We have to remove the light. And so they just legislated you right off the streets of your land. Why? To protect their goods. To protect their goods. But the Bible says when the stronger one comes... Hello, there's a new sheriff in town. There's another king, one called Jesus. And what does that stronger do? He busts up that strong man and delivers his goods. Amen. So please go a little bit. How, how long do I have, Pastor? Be your liberty. liberty. This guy, they're saying, get him out of here. This guy, keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, brothers and sisters, I'm just going to share how the Lord dealt with me. Okay? And I want you to understand, in the ministry, I have always been a preacher of righteousness. I've never shied away from the burning issues of the day. I never played the religious game. I never played the political game. If, if, if there was sin in my nation, if there was sin in the church, if there was sin in the culture, if there was sin in me or in my family, I dealt with it. I, I did not play that game. And I could honestly say that if you ask me, are you pro-life, I would say, absolutely. I'm a Christian. Of course. No-brainer. Right? 
But at that point in my life, it was a preference. You know, I really wish to goodness that our nation didn't murder our sons and daughters. That's, I don't, that's not good. All right? But it was a preference. It wasn't a conviction. See, I prefer this not happen. But I wasn't convicted on what I'm supposed to do as a man of God. To intervene, to interpose. See, there was this great missing link because I was preaching from the pulpit, abortion is murder, and then the Spirit of God comes to me, hey, bud, you got the right rhetoric. Why are you not acting like someone is truly dying? I really didn't have an answer for that. But that was the thing that God struck this moral chord in my life. And let me just tell you, brothers and sisters, this is so important for our integrity and credibility before God in this world. If we're going to make true claims, biblically, it is so important we follow up with godly action. Our, our rhetoric has to equal the action. Faith without works is what? It's dead. In other words, our witness can ring hollow. Now, how many, besides me, you don't want your witness to ring hollow? Like when you testify and witness, you want the Spirit of God to start regenerating people. Amen? So critically important. So here I was in this condition, and I, you know, I thought I was blowing and going. I think I, you know, I was doing a great work for the Lord. And, and then he comes along and he kind of confronts me. And really, honestly, Brothers and sisters, it was a level of hypocrisy. It was. Even though I was saying the right things. And he busted me. And, and he truly set me up. Uh, remember, I think it was Jeremiah, he says, Lord, you set me up and I'm set up. Well, that's what he did to me. He royally set me up. And the Bible says, out of two or three witnesses, let it be established. So here's the first witness. I was doing some campus ministry, you know, preaching the gospel at the campuses and doing a good work, an evangelistic work. And there was a good pastor friend of mine. He was a, a campus pastor. He said, Russ, hey, man, I got this video. And the video was called The Massacre of Innocents. He says, when you have a chance, just check it out. I said, sure, brother, no problem. And a few days went by, and my wife, my first wife, who passed away, she, she was going to a woman's meeting, and I was all alone in the house. So I thought, all right, pop it in. And this was back with VHS, so <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of aging myself here. <laughs> all right? And like I said, it was called The Massacre of Innocence, and I, I put the tape on. And the first part of the tape traces child sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood biblically to the tribes of Moab and Ammon. That incestuous affair with Lot and his daughters, from that affair came child sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood. That's how it was in introduced into this world. So he does a brilliant job of laying out the case biblically. But it was the second part. Second part of it. All I can tell you, brothers and sisters, it was my Isaiah 6 moment. I saw the Lord. And uh, my, my, my body, my mind, my faculties were not prepared for this assault. See, up to that point, I was saying abortion was wrong, but I never saw an abortion. I didn't see it. And all of a sudden, he, 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 in the second part of the video, he, he's like, he's got Pat Benatar. Anybody remember the old rocker Pat Benatar? Again, aging myself. But she had this song about child abuse. Pat, that's what you are. And every time she screamed, Pat, the 
these were children. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, and listen, if you, if, if you partake of abortion, if you have symptoms of this thing, God has cleansed you. There's no condemnation in you whatsoever. Amen? Because he's the only one that can bring life out of death. Amen? And I don't want to say this in a condemning way, and I don't want to get so graphic, but it's the reality, brothers and sisters. So every time she screams, help, it's for children. I'm, I'm watching my sacred limbs decapitate in hell and blood everywhere. And when I tell you I was not prepared for this, and I did what every self-respecting Christian man would do, to my bedroom and I fell prostrate before God and brothers and sisters I'm not talking crying here I'm not talking weeping I'm talking about a wailing crying came from my chest hurt there was sounds coming out of me like a wounded animal literally the, the Bible says the intercession the spirit groaning oh I went to that place I went right to that place and in my mind I love my nation I really do. I love my heritage. And we owe a lot to the Scott Irish. We're beholden to you. But I seriously hate what we have become. I really do. And in my mind, I'm going, we are such a sick and depraved and perverted people that we would do this to our own children. And when I say God shattered my life, it really was. It was the Isaiah 6 thing. I'm unraveled. I'm undone. And I'm like, I'm like one of those guys, once I see it, I can't walk away. I can't pretend like I didn't see it. I saw it. And so now, I, you know, I'm, I'm I, you know, <clears throat> my whole life, ministry, family just blew up right in my face. Right? And I'm going, oh, my gosh. And so the second week, I'm watching TV, and then there's a group of Christians that are intervening, interposing at the death camp doors. They were going on the property, exercising the doctrine of interposition. You've got the oppressor, you have the intended target, the victim, and there are those that are going to stand in the gap, make up the hedge, and rescue those from the oppressor. And so I'm watching this. So the week prior, God just busts my heart, opens my eyes. The next thing I see is Christians singing praise and worship at the death camp, praying for everybody except themselves and being hauled into jail. And I'm like, whoa. Wait, what does this mean? The third week. I'm at my office, at the church. I get a knock at the door. Strange man, I've never met in my life. He says, are you the pastor of this church? I said, I'm one of them. He says, we need to talk. I'm like, okay. What do we need to talk about? He says, I just returned from a death camp. I said, oh, man, you're, you're telling me that you were there at a wedding that you had just served? Up to that point, pretty much this was a Catholic issue. They owned the pro-life movement. Evangelicals were very late coming to this battle, I'm just telling you. And that puts us in the awkward position because as evangelicals, we say we have the truth. We have partaken of God's salvation. We believe this book. Now, I know there's Catholics that are saved in spite of the system, but the system itself does not lead to God's salvation. But they were the only ones fighting a battle. And so what happened during this time, God sent a spirit of repentance upon the evangelical church. If you have your Bibles, 
I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 1 because this was one of the passages that God just used to just hammer our hearts. See, because up until rescue in America, this is what the evangelical church was saying. They were pointing outward. The problem is those rascals in the Supreme Court. The problem is the pro-abortion crowd. The problem are the sodomites. The problem is the ACLU. Our, our fingers were pointing outward, blaming everybody else for what was happening in our nation. Do you know where we did not point the finger? Take a guess. Now, this connects to Isaiah chapter 1. So here's Isaiah chapter 1. How many know this is the, the first book of the prophetic books of the Bible? Amen? I love the book of Isaiah. There's a part of me thinks it should have been in the New Testament because <laughs> he, he knew. He knew some things about the Lord and the Messiah. That's just incredible. But brothers and sisters, please hear this. It's not a coincidence. It's not an accident that the first prophetic book of the Bible, the first chapter, deals with a religious people that are tolerating child sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood. It's the first thing that God addresses prophetically in Israel. How many know that's significant? What does that tell you about the priority of God? Like this is like really, really important to him. And so when you go through these passages of scripture, you got to keep that in mind. And, and this was like the passage of scripture that the Lord did to break us up and lead us to repentance. So he says in verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? Listen, to trample my courts. Like in Psalms, like come into the courts, right? Come into the courts. Let's praise the Lord, right? Here, he's using the word trample. Uh, excuse me? You told us, you invited us into the courts, and now you're saying we're trampling upon it. Um, are we missing something here? He says, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. By the way, who instituted that? Who, did, did, they, did they come up with this? I wonder how we could religiously worship the Lord. I know. Let's have solemn assemblies. Let's set apart a day so we can worship the Lord. Is that how it came about? Who instituted this? God, right? The Lord. He instituted the religious practices, the religious ceremonies, right? All of this was instituted by God. Now watch how he responds to this. He says, they are, he says, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. He says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. And so the issue at that point is, why, God? Why, why, would, why wouldn't you hear us anymore? Why wouldn't you see us anymore? And here is the, the, his response. Your hands are full. Of blood. Brothers and sisters, this is the reality that you are now facing. Child sacrifice, the shedding of innocent blood, what we euphemistically call abortion, has moved from the individual who commits that sin and crime. It has now become your national sin, your national abomination. 
understand this for a surety, the penalty is not removed. It just shifts from the individual that commits the sin and the crime, and now it comes upon the entire nation. The penalty is called blood guiltiness. Now, you do understand when you study this book, how has God treated nations that killed his babies, shed their blood, and paraded their sin like Sodom? How did God treat those nations? What happened to them? <coughs> and so, brothers and sisters, you, know, you understand I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, this is what we went through and we've been through it for 50 years. Our nation was falling apart. It's literally imploding before our very eyes. And I had warned for 35 years going to the church, going to the saints. Do you have not eyes to see? Do you not have ears to hear? Do you understand what you have unleashed upon our nation? You go to the church. Oh, that's a political issue. You go to the politician. That's a church issue. Where, where do I go to plead the case of these little ones? And everybody keeps passing the buck, kicking the can down the road. And where is this leading? So this is what he says to us, right? Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Listen. Listen. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Watch this. Defend the fatherless. Those children being led to slaughter, what are they? The orphan that's victimized in the scriptures never called the motherless, never called the churchless, never called the stateless. You know what they call? Abortion on a human level. This is a man's issue. And why is that? Because God called men to protect, provide, and care for women and children. That is our divine task in the earth. And once abortion is released, I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, it's going to impact manhood. It's going to impact motherhood. It's going to impact your families. It's going to impact your children. It, it truly will. So what, what did abortion do in America? It made our daughters a prey. It made our daughters a target. So men can become serial fornicators. Target our daughters. Get them pregnant. Put the plastic on the table. Take care of it. And if you don't, I'm out of here. And so who carries the onus? Who carries the burden? And this is, this is where feminism, I'm just telling you, is so whacked. The very thing they say they hate about manhood, they're promoting it. They're enabling it. Irresponsible manhood. Where they get all their pleasure and no responsibility. And this is supposed to be enlightening. This is supposed to be progressive in our nation. So he says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Watch this. Though your sins are like scarlet. Everybody say scarlet. scarlet. What color is that? That's red, right? When you think of sin, is that the color you choose? When you think of sin, what do you normally think of? Black. What sin is he talking about? Now remember, he's talking to the nation. The nation. And he says, though your sins are as scarlet, right? They shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And he goes on from there. 
So brothers and sisters, just watch this. So here we are, evangelicals, right? God is starting to convict us, and he's taking words like this, and this is in camera, and he is just busting us up. But by busting us up, he can get his eyes to see. You know that you're, you're a part of two lands, right? You're a citizen of Ireland, right? And you're a citizen of heaven, right? And so, listen, you know, there's no devil in heaven. There's no child sacrifice in heaven. There's no sodomy in heaven. There's no tyranny in heaven. There's no cult cultural corruption in heaven. That's here on the earth. And we're here. And I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, as citizens of heaven, God wants us to help the citizens of this earth. Amen? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? And what's our obligation as Christians? What's our first priority? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And why is that so important when, it, when it's on a national scale? Well, Proverbs tells us it's only righteousness that exalts a nation. How many want peace and security for your children? Come your way. Take it. In America, brothers and sisters, give me a piece of our history. How many remember Alexis de Tocqueville? You ever hear that name? Can I get some water, please? Don't you hate it when the preacher drinks and you don't? <laughs> Alexis de Tocqueville came to America because we were the new kid on the block, and we were like, we just shot like a star, man. Like, I'm like, whoa, there's crazy over there. Like, who are these people? How in the world did they rise to this ascendancy? They're just like, they just started. And like, they just seem to be black or something. And and he he came over to find out what was the secret of our success. It was a nine-month tour. He did some investigative reporting. Why is America global? What is it about these people? And so he said he went searching, right? He went searching. He went to our agricultural community, didn't find it there. He went to the factories in the Industrial Revolution, didn't find it there. He went to the halls of power, our government system, didn't find it there. You know where he found it, brothers and sisters? He said it was only when I went into the churches of America and heard their preachers thunder righteousness. He said, then I knew the secret of the greatness of America. America is great because America is good. And if she ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. And that is what's happening to our nation right now. God is removing our candlestick. We're an empire that's collapsing right before our very eyes. And there is no reason why we have to be hoping only in righteousness and in God. Our churches have become therapy churches. Entertainment centers. No longer hold men accountable to the truth of God's word. And so the church herself has been involved in our own decline and demise. And by our silence, we are just historically understand this truth, brothers and sisters. Whenever we remain silent and inactive when national idolatry and abomination is being set up in our midst, it only weakens. Be fair. The seed won't get down. It only strengthens the oppressor. Because it only prolongs the suffering of the victim. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what's the one in that God has used throughout history. What institution ended human suffering?
sacrifice. What did Patrick do when he was here? What did he do? There was human sacrifice happening in this nation. It ain't here no more. Because a Christian man filled with the word and the spirit of God said this, I will not tolerate this here. Out! And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, whatever gospel is happening back then, may it come upon you and may it be in you and follow his example. Who went to slavery? Who went to atrocity? Was it the Republicans? Was it the Democrats? I don't know where your political party is here. Was it politics that ended all this? No, it wasn't. It was the church of the living God. Why? Because we know two things really strong. Jesus Christ is Lord. And every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. He is Lord to the glory of the Father. And they also understood this truth. Man is made in the image of God. Those sons and daughters are not your property or your commodity. They are precious children made in the image of God. And you're not just breaking their bodies and shedding their innocent blood. You are desecrating the very image of God. Abraham Lincoln, in the days of slavery, he said this. Talk about our black brothers and sisters that we were enslaving. He said, no man was sent by God into this world with his divine image to be stomped on. And he's saying to America during the Civil War, we have taken the very image of God and we have stomped them to the ground. And guess what? We're stomping again. Precious brothers here, Brother Wesley and Brother Mark, when they contacted me, that, that was the purpose. They said, Brother, we are now facing what you have endured. We don't want to see this happen to our church. Please hear my heart, brothers, and sisters. God forbid Ireland ends up South America. Because you will rule the day. I promise you. This thing is not in strength in your nation here. They're trying to, but they don't got their towels and claws into the fabric of your nation yet. But that's what they're working with. And so understand this, brothers and sisters. You know how we're going to get through this? Just hold on. Pastor Stewart, two keys in this battle are pastors and magistrates. Those are the two keys, brothers and sisters. The church has to do her duty before God, and the state must do their duty before God. Okay? And so that's what we're working on in America. We, we, we're done with the federal government in America. We don't even deal with that. You don't exist in our world. You're a farce. You've lost all illegitimacy to ruling our nation. But we are working on the local level. We're mobilizing churches. We're mo mobilizing pastors. We're training them in the doctrine of interposition, the doctrine of oaths and magistrates. Amen. And then we're going to our local magistrates and say, you've got a God-given duty before God. The very purpose for civil government, the very reason why God put that sword in your hands is to be a ministry of justice, to punish the evildoer as God defines evil and protect those who are good in God's sight. That is your duty before your king. Amen. So what does abortion do? It takes that sword and it perverts it. They're now going to protect murderers who are slaying children for blood money, and they're going to punish you for trying to save their life. Do you understand? That sword is it's not neutral. If your government is going to hold this, defend this, celebrate this, they must of necessity punish the righteous. Why is that? Because these are our good. Lion. There's 
a lion inside of you. And that lion will still roar. See, I mean, you got to get Holy Ghost disciples. Tenacious, determined. No, sir. Not on my watch. It ain't going to happen. Devil and you minions, you're out of here. We're not going to stand by while you murder and butcher babies and parade your sin like Sodom. Go bring that somewhere else, not here in Ireland. And for a long time, brothers and sisters, you had that testimony in the world. I'm telling you. You know, you know your little, little nation, when you were a beacon of hope to so many, I know me, it was. I look at Ireland and go, that's my nation, I love it. God, why don't we have people like that? Why don't we have a government like that? And now I'm watching the same forces that invaded my land trying to come here and take you guys over. So, brothers and sisters, listen, I'm going to conclude here. I just want to encourage you. You, uh, you have Wesley over here. You have Mark. Oh, I got my, my book. That's the field manual, by the way, Pastor, if you please get a copy of that. Okay, that's the field manual. Because I've been in this battle for 35 years. I've heard the Lord's things along the way that can really benefit you. And that's why I wrote the book. That's available. And I believe they have a sign-up sheet if you want to stay in contact with Wesley and Mark. We need to build a little army here, brothers and sisters. We need to build a little army. Like in the state of Texas, did, did anybody know my testimony on my son, Jeremiah Thomas? Has anybody heard my testimony? I got my son up there. But our son uh, passed away of cancer at 16 years old. Before he died, he had a conversation with the governor of Abbott in his dying words to, to abolish abortion in the state of Texas. Do you agree to die now? The Texas church said, if you agree to that, I can die well. I know. And that, that went viral all over the world. All over the world. And uh, that's a point later on. Yes, thank you. Thank, everybody say thank God for a helpmate. <laughs> and she's also my meter lady, too. When I start going really heavy, she's like, oh, geez, geez. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the point being is the Lord used that to build a little army in Texas. And we have over 100,000 people in our medical information. And so whatever we're doing with Texas, like, they can't ignore us anymore. They can no longer play their religious and political games with the strength of these kids. Those days are done. Those days are done. So you either do your duty or find some other way to improve yourself because you're done here. We're not tolerating this anymore. I'm just telling you, we're not going to play the pro-life game. And here's the pro-life game, brothers and sisters. You have pro-life politicians, right? And you had pro-life politicians vote to criminalize you on the street. Oh, I'm a pro-lifer. I got my vote. Check. And then you have the pro-life groups. And they raise a lot of money. Right? And then the pro-life politicians and the pro-life groups, they get together, they hug each other, pat each other on the back, they say, take pictures together, and everybody gets what they want except for our precious baby. We have slaved this land for nearly a 50 Seriously, wake up, and I'm consciously thinking, I'm still here. God hasn't nuked us yet. And I'll tell you something about the moral suffering. You're going to see it no more. But it doesn't go on forever, brothers and sisters. There are lines that nations could cross. And so here's your opportunity, brothers and sisters. If God gives us the opportunity at the church and the state level to get this right, if we refuse, then God himself steps in. And typically when he steps in, it's with a heavy hand. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, you want to avoid that at all costs because you're talking about your children and your grandchildren's future. All, I mean, just turn your page. Just read this one more time. Dear God of the universe, have mercy. Say about. Just 
Stand in the gap. The neighbor can catch Jesus. Because he's that publican guy, right? Jesus, calm down. Look, you are full. And they take the theology of the church house and make it biology in the street and in the state that you are in. Can I get an amen? amen. Are you upset with me? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, boy. Well, Father, I know that was a fire hose. And there's a lot that my brothers and sisters are going to have to wrestle with and sort through, Father God. And I thank you that you are patient and long-suffering with us, oh, God. But I do pray, Lord, that your word... And your spirit that agrees would be the convicting force in our life, God. Father, I do pray that you open our eyes to see what is at stake here, Lord, for our future and our hope. Lord, we want our children to know your blessings. We don't want them to see them harmed by this thing, Father. Lord, you have bequeathed to Ireland an incredible heritage. An incredible history. And the enemy hates it. And he wants to stomp it to the ground. He wants to snuff it out. And I pray, Lord, for the, the people here in Ireland, those who call upon the name of the Lord. They be like David, Lord, who wept because his nation did not obey the commandments of God. Lord, I pray a righteous jealousy to arise in the hearts of pastors and elders and Christians in this land, Father God, that we would be jealous for the Lord our God. Lord, that we would not be dumb dogs that don't bark when our master's being attacked. And that's what's happening here, Lord. This enemy is attacking you. He's attacking your children, Lord God. And I do pray, Lord, just like you are jealous for us, Lord, that we would be jealous for you, your name, your glory, your authority in the earth. Lord, we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ, you have planted us to secure your interests in the earth. Help us not to fail, Lord, in this hour. And I do pray, Lord, seriously, I'm praying this, Lord. Whatever resources, whatever virtue you place in and upon Patrick, Lord, let that anointing fall upon the pastors and the churches in Ireland. The snakes have come back. And they need to be driven out again. Amen. So God, give them that Holy Spirit determination. In Jesus' name we pray. And the saints said, Amen. 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 God bless you.